Hi, Matt. To welcome. Can you can you see if you can speak? Yep, I can speak. Can you hear me? Uh, perfect. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, absolutely great. Uh, Darnell, what about yourself? Uh, I don't see anything yet. Uh, okay, maybe we'll give you a, a moment to uh, to figure it out, uh, Darnell. Um, just uh, again, huge thank you for everyone joining here. Uh, we're going to uh, have this uh, this Twitter space uh, together with myself, uh, with Matthew Schmeck from Avalabs and Darnell Walker from GBG. And what we uh, what we want to touch upon today is the topic of uh, regulation, self regulation, uh, what we can do, you know, as as individuals uh, and as an industry in order to try to avoid these things that happened, you know, this, this, this last week with FTX and uh, Alameda, it's uh, been a tough week for, for most of you, I can imagine. Um, but there are things that uh, are, are worth discussing here. Hey, Darnell, thank you for joining. How is, uh, how's your mic? Yeah, all good, thank you. I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, can you hear very me. clear. Cool. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so... Uh, Matthew and Darno, thank you so much for joining. Uh, you're uh, two absolutely amazing people, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, that you were willing to 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 be to be to join this space as well. And I think we will have uh, a really interesting conversation today. But before we dive into that, um, maybe if, if if you can both uh, explain a little bit about about yourself, you you personally, uh, what's what 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 brought you into blockchain and uh, uh, what 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 drives you. Uh, before we dive into, you know, what, what's uh, uh, what's Apple Labs, what does it stand for, what's GPG and what does it stand for. Um, so maybe Matthew, you can go first. Yeah, so my name is Matt Schmank. I'm a part of the Apple Labs business development team. Um, joined around nine months ago now. And in terms of what business development does for Apple Labs, is it's in charge of growth of the Avalanche network. And uh, I started off in traditional finance for about a year and a half directly out of undergrad. I'm on level three of the CFA and I have a little bit of uh, Solidity programming experience as well. In terms of sort of how I got here, um, my route is kind of interesting. So I, I really found like crypto and blockchain and late 2020, early 2021. Started off kind of the normie way with uh, just buying Bitcoin, like listening to podcasts watching YouTube videos, et cetera. And uh, one thing led to another, kind of fell down the rabbit hole, especially after the uh, downturn in like May 2021, when the market kind of crashed, wiping out a bunch of leverage and decided, hey, I really find this stuff interesting. I'm going to go on chain and really learn about every protocol that I can. And um, <laughs> little did I know I would kind of make this a full-time career uh, there came a point, I think, late 2021, where I was spending more time uh, learning about crypto and blockchain and everything than uh, my my day job and really studying for like the CFA. So um, that's kind of what got me here in terms of what Avalabs does. Um, Avalabs is the servicing provider for the Avalanche network. Avalanche is a network of interoperable blockchains. Um, and most people know the primary network and more specifically the C chain, which is an instance of EVM. But our long term vision is to scale horizontally via subnets, and subnets are very similar to um, app chains within the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, Avalanche was actually founded by uh, a professor from Cornell and some of his students. Uh, the kind of earliest white paper was about the novel consensus mechanism, which was actually the third consensus mechanism ever created after Classical and Nakamoto, and that's Avalanche Consensus. It, it provides sub-second finality and sort of infinite scalability in terms of number of nodes um, by using sub-sampling. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about myself and Avalabs and how it relates to Avalanche as a, as a, a network. So. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for the extensive introduction, uh, Matt. And uh, really cool uh, that you also have uh, a, a bit of Solidity programming background. Do, do you still uh, uh, double in, in, in the Solidity development? 
Uh, not too much. I, I kind of look at code when I can, or if I want to see how like an exploit occurred, you know what I'm saying? Just trying to figure out what exactly happened. But, uh, now yeah. it's more just like everyday, uh, kind of BD related activities. So. Cool. Yeah. Good on you, man. I think if everyone had a little bit more of, of a sense of what Solidity code would look like, it would make due diligence on, on new projects that they would, you know, maybe want to buy tokens from, um, much easier. Uh, well, thanks again, uh, Darnell. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much. Yeah, so I guess my my introduction into cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin was from the Mt. Gox era. So uh, GBG signed Mt. Gox as a organization and as a company. What we do is, is the KYC and the onboarding of new customers. So I heard about this company at the time, they'd spent quite a lot with us. And then before I knew it, they disappeared, but left us with a bunch of cash. So I found out about this cryptocurrency called Bitcoin that everybody was buying. And at the time, it was $30 and then rose to around about $60. And uh, I just was fascinated, but equally very, very scared about it as well. So I kind of left it, came to 2017. Uh, a friend of mine made quite a lot of money from it and you know, he didn't go out and buy a Lambo, but he did retire. And uh, I just thought, right, I've got to learn a bit more about this this thing. So I just delved into the rabbit hole ever since. And uh, equally, I've been working in the KYC onboarding and uh, fraud prevention space for, for over the last decade. So for those that may not know who GBG are, we're often described as like a technology business or a data business, but really we are in the business of creating trust. So online digital trust, uh, helping companies with regards to global digital identity for prevention and anti-money laundering. So um, just for that seamless onboarding experience. Uh, some of those in, uh, solutions also include things like a uh, global address lookup, um, global KYC and transactional monitoring of wallets. So that, that's me in a nutshell. Nice, amazing. Uh, thank you as well, Donal. Uh, uh, you was really early, man. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people are probably quite jealous on the fact that you were so early on. Um, and above and yourself, maybe not everyone knows uh, who I am. So I'm uh, Matthias Fries, one of the co-founders and uh, the CTO of uh, Alliance Block. Um, how I uh, got into, into the, the, the crypto industry myself is I, I've always been in software development. Since I was 11 years old, uh, I've been developing many different industries, many different programming languages. And at some point, um, I went into management, then um, uh, at, at, a, at a really large enterprise in the Netherlands, uh, did that for like nine years, and I, I wanted something more. I wanted something more meaningful. So I went to a smaller company where I was in charge of product development. Uh, I was a product owner. I was responsible for business development. And so it was much more fun. And um, during this, um, I, I already read about Bitcoin a couple of years ago before that. And, um, I, I knew what it stood for. I thought it was cool, but I, I, I didn't really grasp like really, you know, what, what it means, you know, going forward. Um, until I started to read about Ethereum for a use case that I was working on for, for a potential client. And when I, when I read about Ethereum, you know, smart contracts and, and uh, immutable programs running on the blockchain, I was like, man, this is huge. Why is nobody talking about this? And, 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 and then I you know, saw crypto Twitter and crypto Reddit and, and, and Telegram. And, and then I saw that actually a lot of people are talking about it. And, and, and that's when I became part of the community. So it was back in 2017. I started to uh, put some money into, uh, into some tokens as well. And um, I, I think you put it really nicely, uh, Darnell. It really is a rabbit hole. And uh, once, once you get in, you, you, you cannot get out. Like, I'm ruined for life. <laughs> yeah, right? for sure. I'm ruined, <laughs> ruined for life, but in the best ways. I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. And it's, uh, it's absolutely... The, the, the community is relentless and, and, and no mercy, but in, in all the best ways. Uh, so I love that. 
Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, I think there is a lot to, uh, lot to uncover uh, today. Um, just for, for, for uh, the ones that don't know Alliance Block, um, Alliance Block is basically is a DeFi hub, or uh, as we sometimes call it, the AWS of DeFi. And we supply a suite of interoperable products that enable seamless gateways between traditional finance and decentralized finance. Um, what we do this by developing an end-to-end -end infrastructure, leveraging decentralized technology to um, empower individuals, startups in, in, in the crypto industry, but also uh, sometimes outside of the crypto industry, and businesses to, to, to build, navigate, and participate in uh, the decentralized, uh, uh, decentralized blockchain solutions. So we try to uh, go towards an ecosystem where compliant uh, rules are its, at its heart. So compliance is, uh, is very important for it. And you, you, you see it also, you know, in, in our communication, we are very, uh, we take this very, very seriously. Uh, and, and sometimes we do come up as boring because of that, but we really are not. <laughs> um, so anyway, today, uh, good to know for uh, people that maybe joined a little bit late, uh, this, this Twitter space is recorded and can be uh, listened again to after this Twitter space is ended will be posted by, uh, by the Alliance Club official Twitter account. Um, so I think, yeah, let's just dive in. Um, we'll have just a nice conversation uh, uh, with each other between uh, Matt, Daniel, and myself. Um, uh, so, so Matt, um, maybe would you, would you like to start? <clears throat> yeah. So um, actually, I was wondering if you could touch upon, uh, I guess, a little bit of more about the Alliance Block Suite, maybe provide an example of a project that has leveraged the suite and its, its own success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when, when you look at uh, what we're building, we have you know several different products that work completely independently, like decentralized exchange, uh, uh, the, the peer to peer funding platform that we call Funders, uh, an interoperability bridge, and, and these all make sense on their own. Uh, but they also make sense together inside an ecosystem. And when you look at who we serve, you know, we, we have to think about a project, a cryptocurrency project, for example, that um, goes through different phases in, in its life cycle. Uh, it can be uh, pre-funding, uh, so then you know, it makes sense to go through funders. Um, and when they are you know, in the middle of funding or you know, post-funding, um, they are going to look for solutions to help forward the roadmap. Uh, so this can be interoperability if they need more networks, or they can use DEX if um, they need to, you know, incentivize the community to, to help with the liquidity solutions. Um, it can be it can be the DeFi terminal. Um, so we look at different life cycles of a project, and in 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 in, in, in its heart for what we do with with TIDV uh, uh, combined what we what we aim to build with Nexera is to have this ecosystem where you can also opt in to do all these things compliantly. So you could, for example, say that on the DEX, I want to create a liquidity pool, but I only want verified, KYC verified um, uh, wallets participating in this liquidity pool. And then suddenly it becomes really interesting for traditional finance to participate in these liquidity pools because they know that the funds that were added to this liquidity pool and the trades that are taking place in this liquidity pool are in essence compliant because we know where the money came from, we know who the people are, they are not in a sanctions jurisdiction, they, are, uh, they don't have a fraudulent past, etc, etc. So that's what, we, um, that's what we stand for and that's what we do. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so both of you two have a pretty strong background in terms of regulatory compliance. Um, I was wondering if you guys could provide your thoughts on like the FTX situation, what happened, and like really go in detail about your thoughts behind it. Yeah, so, um, you know, first of all, I think FTX shows that decentralization did not fail. It was centralization that failed um, yet again. As you know, the irony, I think a lot of people already pointed this out also on crypto Twitter, is the fact that you know, when Bitcoin was created, um, it, it was created because of the 2008 economic downturn. And um, in, in order to give, you know, more power to the people to avoid, you know, this dependence on, on, dependence on centralized entities, right? And then, you know, when we are years into a maturing industry, we see that we want to put ourselves depending on decentralized entities again. So the irony is, is, is really there. 
And I, I think, you know, it's easy to say, and I, I had a Twitter, Twitter thread on this as well. Um, it's easy to scream, like, we need more or stricter regulations. Um, but I think that uh, we, we don't really know what we're asking for uh, if, if, if we do that. Because if we, if we want governments to, to intervene in order to avoid things like this in the future, um, they will not do exactly what we, what, what we will ask for. You know, we, we've seen, you know, from, from past examples that, you know, governments usually do not fully understand or fully grasp, you know, what, what crypto uh, stands for, what we do, what we want to do. So if we want to avoid, you know, this kind of well, it's black swan events, it's not really black swan events anymore after three in a row, right? But if, um, if, if we want to avoid things like, like this happening in the future, we should have a proactive stance. And I think we should really, you know, think about what we can do, you know, self-regulating. If we can, you know, show that we govern ourselves and each other, we could avoid govern government interference and we can, you know, write our own story on how this, what this industry should look like. Uh, Darnad, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's uh, crazy, crazy, right? Because we look at things like uh, the films The Wolf of Wall Street and then we've also got The Big Short. And if you look on Netflix, it's listed in the comedy section. But this is not funny. This is like real life people have been hurt in terms of their funds and potentially life savings wiped out. So, uh, yeah, we, we really should be looking to learn lessons from this. So, in my opinion, what's needed is both education and, and regulation. But, I mean, we saw last year what happens when companies halt customer withdrawals as the GameStop scenario played out with Robinhood. But let's make it super relevant to us all on the call today is, you know, some people may not necessarily trade, but we placed faith and trust in the banks that we use today. And and that's because many have been around for hundreds of years, although, uh, you know, FTX came out of nowhere and was spawned in 2019. But, you know, banks like ING, Barclays, Lloyds, HSBC, uh, we've placed a trust in them because of their longevity. But then you've got new ones that pop up, such as Revolut, Monzo and Starling Bank that have like built a sound reputation but however we must be educated to know that the banks use our money in terms of like fractional reserve banking and so using that fiat money uh, to do so as they please behind the scenes we must educate ourselves to perform due diligence in the institutions in my opinion whom we place our hard-earned funds with so now knowing that FTX was incorporated in Antigua and Barbuda and headquartered in the Bahamas and was always an unregulated entity. Would people who were placing large sums of cash still do so trusting? I don't know. Maybe if they knew that the company was regulated, yet perhaps um, not if they were where they are and sorry were aware of what was going on of course now naturally it's not every day that the ceo of an exchange is involved in and i'll say allegedly stealing customer funds gambling like he was at the casino with no limits but as we speak ftx filing uh, indicates it's had liabilities of between 10 billion to 50 billion and, uh, and we also know that SPF secretly transferred funds of around about 10 billion of customer funds out the back door as well, um, avoiding accounting red flags. But to my initial point, Robinhood was legally allowed to halt withdrawals despite it being unfair. Banks are legally allowed to perform fractional reserve banking despite that when things go wrong, and they do, for example, if we look back to August 2020 and the U.S. pulls out of Afghanistan, leaving people queuing up for days to withdraw their funds. And in February 2022 um, of this year, Ukrainians and Russian citizens again queuing up outside of their banks, willing to earn trying and struggling to get their funds out. We need to be educated to avoid these things happening. And, you know, we are in a era where technology has evolved 
to uh, to provide ourselves with the ability to do so with things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, should you choose and take self-sovereignty of them? Yeah, man, I think uh, uh, and this is this is really uh, regulation is slow, right? It's, 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 yeah. slow to, it's slow to catch up. And um, I, I think this underlines the fact that you know, if we agree that on some points, especially the centralized entities, you know, we want them to, you know, be more or better regulated, um, we need to we need to be proactive, and self-regulation can be a solution here. And I think, you know, CZ from Binance, um, he 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 led with a great example with uh, proof of reserves um, and, and, hmm. and against liabilities and. I think you know if, if as a community we would demand from every every centralized exchange to do the same, you know we would already go towards you know more more transparent um, industry where we don't need governments to tell uh, uh, to to check those uh, to check those proof of reserves, uh, which will probably use completely different kind of ledgers or administration to to check those. We probably come with a lot of back doors. But we, you know, as a community, we know how to check these things on chain. We know when, when they are lying or when they are not. Um, so you know, for, for me, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. Anyway, um, I would really like um, uh, to, to, to hear, you know, both of your opinions on, on, on this matter. Like, how would you address the, the, the need for a clear, clear regulatory framework for, for the industry? Uh, Darnell, maybe you first. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of regulation moving slow, but the industry, as we've seen, it moves at light speed. And um, but regulation really means more red tape to adhere to uh, to a company, which you know, from their perspective, ultimately has an impact on time and also on profits. But if it's demanded from customers to see a company's holdings, such as CZ did, and uh, and we do so more frequently, we should get that. But we need to remember that what that is doing is potentially only showing us a point in time, and uh, and should and we should do that and take it with a pinch of salt, as we don't know if the funds are theirs, how long they've held them, and of course, what liabilities that the business may have, which may outweigh the funds that are even shown. Um, so ultimately, I, I do think but clear and ambiguous regulation will help both retail investors and institutions interested investing in this space to have more confidence to do so. And, uh, and I, for one, would definitely welcome more of that happening. Yeah, uh, cool. I guess also to echo uh, what was said before, uh, nothing really that was decentralized failed. It was all centralized entities. And not only that, a lot of these centralized entities are private organizations, unlike something like a Coinbase in which you have like quarterly or annual financials because they're listed on the NASDAQ. Uh, you don't really get accurate financial statements, at least released to the public. And a lot of the public don't even really know how to read a, a financial statement to begin with. And so I think um, at the end of the day, regulation needs to really start with centralized exchanges and then from there kind of go farther down the curve in terms of like decentralization. And uh, personally, um, I think customers sh shouldn't hold their assets on a centralized exchange to begin with. Um, right when that like withdrawal period where uh, the exchange lets you withdraw your your assets to like either a a cold storage wallet or a, something on chain. Um, I would always encourage uh, like self custody. Um, so that that's kind of my thoughts about like centralized entities in terms of regulation, in terms of like DeFi or on chain protocols or assets. Um, I think in relation to um, like let's say algorithmic stables. Um, the Luna downturn, UST, really hurt a lot of retail, kind of thinking that, hey, it's too big to fail. It's a savings account that gets 20%. And obviously, I think some people were duped into believing it was safer than what it is. And so um, I'm kind of indifferent in terms of like regulation of algo stables, um, especially those that aren't really backed by anything. 
But in terms of like true DeFi, something like an Aave, a Curve, a Uniswap, a, a Banky, Trader Joe, Yeti Finance, etc., I think those should, uh, for the most part, continue to be relatively unregulated, especially as they open up um, kind of finance to parts of the world that don't have access to it, um, especially for giving those, I guess, access to stable currencies like the, the U.S. dollar and kind of saving them from whatever that if they are, if it's an economy that has a hyperinflationary currency, ensuring that they have kind of a, a life raft or a way to get out. But um, I think we're, we, we're actually really seeing some interesting stuff happen within Avalanche in, in which we have like kind of regulated DeFi or kind of institutional DeFi, but we also have the unregulated unregulated variety as well. So, and and, and, and if we want to touch on on the subject of um, self regulation, um, do you have any thoughts on this, uh, Matt? Yeah, I guess. Would you mind touching upon what you mean by soft regulation? You mean like guidelines that aren't really. Um, yeah, so, so not, nothing that's law enforced. Um, like I think uh, what what CEC did with with uh, proof of reserves um, is an excellent example of what we can accomplish with with self regulation. And it's also as a community, um, we can decide. You know, what kind of projects do we want to ignore, and what kind of projects do we want to interact with uh, by having a set of standards that we decide upon ourselves. Um, you know, all these things are, you know, kind of a form of self-regulation. So, so what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I, I'm kind of an optimist at the end of the day. I like to believe people always mean the best, but obviously after recent events, um, it's always uh, like prove, don't trust, really be able to see what's going on. And so I think in relation to like self-regulation of what's going um, on, like on chain, it's actually really easy to do just because you have all of like, the scanners and whatnot, and I know some teams, um, they get exploited, but generally the teams that we heavily back in terms of like marketing, um, they do audits, they ensure that um, they don't push something out in terms of an update to their protocol too early. They really ensure everything is uh, fine combed and all of the details are worked out and it's safe to release um, via having audits, like I said. and really testing the protocol on testnet a lot before the actual release date. In terms of self-regulation, um, in terms of like centralized exchanges, I, it's really interesting because proof of reserves is only one half of the equation. You have to have liabilities as well. And also, I mean, because these are our private companies, I think you have to have trusted third parties also auditing their financials to actually like prove that they are what they say. And I think... Um, what we saw with FTX is those trusted third parties, how, how are they even trusted to begin with? And so I think self-regulation um, only goes so far in terms of centralized exchanges. I think also a lot of the very reputable, uh, like the big four accounting for, uh, firms, it's almost more of a, a risk for themselves to take part in like auditing the financials of risky businesses than something that might be an, an easy audit for them. And so it's actually a super tricky situation. <laughs> um, it'd be nice if like everything was on chain, but unfortunately that's not how centralized exchanges work, so. Yeah, no, and, and, and there are, you know, there are good reasons why there's a lot of volume going to centralized exchanges. We cannot just say, you know, you know let's move everything to DEXs and uh, the problem is solved. Like centralized exchanges do have their place, right? Um, but yeah, not, not, not your keys, not your coins is a very good, you know, phrase to live by. And um, if you don't need to have, you know, your tokens on an exchange, you take them off. This, this is a very good lesson. And yeah, I, I, I agree for centralized exchanges. You know, they are regulated, you know, to begin with. So it's not like um, uh, self-regulation is a replacement of uh, existing regulations, but it can definitely be an interesting addition. You know, looking at MICA, MICA is a regulation for, uh, for the crypto industry. MICA came from the European Union. And um, to be clear, MICA was a reaction, a reaction on uh, uh, things that happened that hurt the, the industry. And, you know, 
uh, luckily, Mica doesn't uh, doesn't affect DeFi and DAOs. You know, they are exempt. But you know, the next the next problem that that is introduced in the industry and FTX is um, uh, is is not DeFi. So maybe you know it will it, it will not relate to re- new regulations on DeFi. But everything that happens. That will lead to a reaction because governments will feel that they they are forced to react because we cannot you know take care of it ourselves, um, and and they will come with um, with strict regulations which will be very hard to predict. So self regulation will definitely help, but they will absolutely indeed not re- replace existing regulation, or indeed they will not 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 go as so far to um, uh, be able to to to. Um, yeah, re- replace everything uh, with yeah. regards to uh, statements that cannot be read by by the normal people. Like uh, like you said, that's a very good example of what self regulation cannot do. Yeah, I wanted to add in as well that uh, I think it became very apparent as well that we need to have better on and off ramps um, in terms of getting on chain and getting off chain. Like that's something that. Um, it's not necessarily like an easy fix, but it's very apparent now that it, I mean, it, especially if we want mass adoption, there has to be a better way to actually have access to these assets in a trusted manner. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, Darnell, go ahead. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I guess what companies should do as they have been is openly self-regulating themselves in order to draw adoption. Um, some privately owned companies will follow, uh, yet others in my opinion, won't, especially if they're not required to. Um, and then I guess thinking of selves, uh, one of my favorite books that I read through the pandemic of 2020 was by Morgan Housel uh, called The Psychology of Money, Timeless Lessons to Wealth, Greed and Happiness. And a lot of the things to do with self-regulation is also to do with the psychology of self. So can you regulate your feelings and emotions to, to not look at price and simply dollar cost average in every day, week or month? Again, are individuals taking control of their private keys? And, you know, that is the best way to self-regulate. And and again, are individuals performing due diligence on whom they're placing their funds with? These are all key questions which time and time again, people should be asking. And the reason why they should be asking these questions is, Unfortunately, it goes back to trust and and not necessarily trusting a centralized third party, because as um, as you said, Matt, whilst you may think that there's good character and nature in each individual, uh, you know, we, we thought that uh, SBF was giving to charity wholeheartedly. And lo and behold, we've come to find out that that's not been the case as well. Um, whilst he was giving to one, he was taking with the other. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Darnell. And, and I, I've understood that uh, my mic wasn't performing very well, so I, oh, no I, changed, the, I changed the setup. Hopefully um, it's, it's better to hear me now. Yeah, uh, I do apologize for that. <laughs> I've got a question for you there. So... Uh, is there any measure or process or system AVAX and Alliance Block can put in place to solve future incidents like the ones we've seen? That's to you. Yeah, and in, in terms of Avalanche and like what we can control, um, obviously it's a permissionless blockchain, and so we can't require people to really do anything within within our chain. Uh, anyone can deploy here. Anyone can make a protocol, et cetera. But <clears throat> what we've seen recently is kind of our, our team's really thinking about ways to have regulated DeFi, regulated like CDFI almost um, and whatnot. And so some are starting to require KYC on their front end. Some are geo-blocking the U.S., for instance. Um, I, I kind of envision a world where... Um, Maybe you have some sort of on-chain ID solution in which it's uh, privacy protected via like a ZK circuit and it has your like personal information, It's probably like an NFT or something, it's tied to your account and it allows you to go from protocol to protocol. Um, So you know how like when you set up uh, with like a centralized exchange or with a bank, you have to put in like your, your social security if you're in the U.S., date of birth, address, a bunch of like personal information, or like if you're getting a loan, your credit score um, gets drawn upon. 
So I, I envision a world where you almost have like an on-chain identity solution that's also private in which protocols can vet certain parts of your kind of personalized financial identity. Um, we're also building a re like a regulatory compliant subnet in which we're calling an institutional subnet. And like I touched upon before, a subnet's kind of an application specific blockchain in which um, kind of every person within this blockchain will be a KYC uh, individual or institution and same with every builder. And so that's kind of the CD5 or regulatory compliant DeFi that I was talking about um, in which hey, if a regulator needs to go on chain and see who's being a nefarious actor, there's an identity tied to that institution and they can properly like easily discipline them or really know what's going on behind the scenes. So that, that's a little bit about how we think about it. Nice. Uh, thanks, man. Amazing. Uh, Darno, what are your thoughts on, on possible solutions to avoid these incidents in the future? Uh, and, and can you also maybe elaborate on, on the view of GBG? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, what we've witnessed is, in my opinion, this super bad actor in the highest sense. And, uh, you know, we're, we're waiting for the end of the film, aren't we, to understand whether or not uh, he gets caught. But whilst it's not good, uh, I'm thinking about the investors personally that have lost money and unable to withdraw their funds out um, because they've trusted. But what it's brought about is hopefully another key lesson uh, to not be repeated again. Um, from from GBG's perspective, we are doing that that global KYC onboarding of customers. So we're trusting that the individuals that are coming in at the front end are exactly who they say they are, and we're identifying them. Uh, we also have the ability to monitor the transactions of the wallet, but not necessarily tie the two together, which you don't want necessarily. But, um, you know, whilst it was spawned in terms of Bitcoin to be censorship resistant, um, you know, it needs a helping hand. And that, that helping hand is, again, as we go back to regulation and, and requiring regulation to hopefully help the industry grow and mature in the right way so that new projects and new technologies can continue to be spawned off the back of it. You know, uh, uh, so for those that are not fully aware, uh, GVG and Alliance Block um, uh, are, are working together and we've collaborated on uh, TIDV. Uh, so TIDV is a product of, uh, of the collaboration of, of GVG and Alliance Block um, where we want to make it low barrier for projects yeah. to operate compliantly because uh, uh, being compliant it's easy to say in a sentence but to actually you know execute upon this and integrate this in your processes or applications it can be very very cumbersome can be very expensive um, and, and, and and therefore it can be very daunting and uh, as a project you can say well I'm a utility I, I offer a utility token so maybe I don't uh, I, I can you know let, let the KYC verifications uh, I can I can skip it and we saw a lot of projects uh, do this, and uh, we know that in the long term, you know, regulators will catch up on them, and uh, so it's a very dangerous, slippery slope. Um, so, you know, how how can you make this, you know, lower barrier for uh, for projects to be compliant? Is to offer something that can be integrated, you know, on chain, um, where people will be able to uh, reuse their KYC verification, reuse their identity verifications. Uh, on chain without actually disclosing their their information, this makes it cheaper uh, for projects to, uh, to 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 use it because they don't have to integrate um, uh, something from scratch. They don't have to uh, uh, do all KYC verifications from scratch, which can be very uh, expensive if, if you have very low volumes, like hundreds of verification as opposed to hundreds thousands of uh, verifications. Um, and 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 if you make it so low barrier. Um, more projects will be able to choose for compliance and they can also have you know opt-in compliant features in their existing products uh, thanks to, to, to TIDP which you know ensures that 
um, we can also expect more adoption coming from traditional finance. Um, so I think this is this is um, yeah. What 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 are your thoughts on on on, on what we did there uh, uh, together, Darnell? Because it's a, a product from. I think we started speaking about this uh, one and a half year ago. By now. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. We were in the thick of the uh, pandemic, and uh, yeah, we, we yeah. finally managed to launch it. And for me, again, it just shows that there are still brand new use cases for us to be exploring and working together in, in partnership. Um, it's the first of my uh, that I've seen, the first type of that I've seen. So, yeah, I'm excited. Nice, nice, and 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 you know the, the thing is also for the people that have to do the verification uh, because of the fact that you know they only have to do it once. They know it's yep. through a trusted party, not through the third service provider like in like an exchange or the decentralized exchange or you know what, whatever kind of uh, p- uh, platform they are interacting with. Uh, they will be able to not disclose their data, which we know, which happens a lot in the crypto industry. You know, data leaks. Uh, happen and then your your most personal information you know is out on the street and uh, with TIDV you know you are the only one that chooses with whom you share your data and at which point and when to unshare yeah. again and yeah that's this is I think a really important one so it's low barrier for both the the, the users but also the projects um, yeah so uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Matt, anything you want to to to, to address? Um, yeah. So now that we've heard about uh, like TIDEV, do you mind speaking more about like funders, like what it is, and really how it kind of interacts and is a part of your you guys' ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, good one. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah. So, uh, so funders is actually the first product that uh, fully integrates TIDEV. And um, I think interesting story for those that don't know, when we founded uh, Alliance Block back in 2018, um, it was with the initial uh, idea or a basic idea of what Funders is today. And um, our, our um, vision was always that, you know, we needed a platform uh, which is community driven, where, you know, the community, the people that fund projects through buying their tokens have a voice in how this funding process goes. Um, they vote on whether milestones have been hit and whether they deserve the next round of funding and they can earn reputation by doing so. And, you know, integrating uh, 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 TIDV, you know, was a super logical next step because having, you know, a, a project list on funders and for the project then to be immediately, automatically able to raise funds compliantly um, uh, it's a huge deal, uh, especially you know if it if it can be done cheaply, uh, but with all the best practice with regards to compliance in the industry, and you know in in, in funders uh, like you said you know community it's uh, it's super important, but community it's um, it's 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 a collection of people, and every person has an equal opportunity to earn reputation, and with reputation in the 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 the, the industry. It's, uh, it's very important. The better the reputation you have, the more weight you can have in, in, in what you have to say and what you have to vote for. Um, so this is going to play a you know, more important role in the, in, in the entire ecosystem. Fantastic. Um, I've got another question. Are there any upcoming projects uh, raising capital and funders at all? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, Dua will be uh, the first project to launch with funders, and uh, Ardit, uh, the, the <laughs> Ardit, the co-founder of uh, of uh, Dua, he is here. Um, he's listening. Uh, hey, Ardit, hope you're doing well. Um, so yeah, expect uh, uh, expect this uh, uh, next week, and um, uh, yeah, very excited about that one. Uh, very hardworking team, uh, doing very well, and uh, super exciting uh, uh, product coming up. So, um, darn, as uh, a, a crypto native with experience in traditional and regulated environments, um, I would like to hear your thoughts on you know, what features can make a project successful, both from a compliant perspective and a peer-to-peer one. 
Yeah, sure. So, I guess for me, it's the we we use the word again transparency of the project, the transparency of the founders, their history, and and what utility that that project is bringing to the market. You know, TIDV. We've discussed it. It, it will work and. It's something new and revolutionary for people, but there's a lot of projects that are out there that don't necessarily follow these these guidelines or milestones of being able to to provide people with that confidence within order to go and use it or even invest in it. But yet people still do. I always talk about, uh, you know, Apologies if there are many Dogecoin owners on this call, but you know I talk about Dogecoin all the time. You know it has no utility, but people still go and put their hard-earned money into it. Why? What What's going to be needed is things that benefit the industry more and more so, so that more people flock to the industry, not just because it's the, the new shiny thing, but because it has real value to our lives yeah absolutely man and um uh, you know from um and, and 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 again you know really i think um we know what we want from 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 projects what we can offer to projects but there's also something that we can do as a community um and if we want you know this industry to be successful and want just to briefly touch upon this again um, uh, with regards to I, I don't know if self regulation is the right word, but we can you know, have a proactive stance you know when projects like this um, uh, get listed, uh, you know there are more more platforms uh, out there like funders where uh, funds are being raised for new projects. Um, it's really important to do your due diligence as well, right? And uh, yeah. funders, uh, especially in, in future iterations of funders, it's really easy uh, to come together as a community to discuss the, pro- to discuss the project and uh, do the due diligence together. Um, but if you, if you do not necessarily you know, have the right tools, there are always some, some red flags to look out for. And one of the things... That I think is an important topic um, that's often overlooked on you know how important it really is. Like if you look in uh, in 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 the in the, te- in the chats, the Telegram chats, for example, from serious serious projects that take compliance very seriously, they do not allow uh, talks about exchanges or prices or mm. uh, you know the, there's no rocket emojis or hyping or <laughs> promising to do anything to increase the token price or token burns or you know anything in this sense and and and, and sometimes I see you know people don't understand or find it really annoying that these things are not allowed to be discussed but it's for a reason you know it's yeah. it's, it's important to note that you know these are best practices followed in um, in, in regards to respect, you know, the regulators, if, uh, you know, if, if you look long term as a project, then you need to address these things. And as a community, you know, it's, it's on you, it's on us to be able to see this project that do not respect these best practices. And these are best practices. This is not written in any law. But this is, you know, a, a, a best practice to avoid being classified as a security, to avoid to be classified as uh, anything related to a financial instrument. And as a community, we can come together and say, okay, this project, you know, they're speaking about their own token price. You know, it's a red flag for me. I will say, wait, yeah. so we can do this together, right? It's, it's on us. We have the power. And um, yeah, so I think it's, it's really important to realize how much power we really, really have as a community to weed out the bad projects from the good projects that really want to do well and be here long term and want to contribute to, to, to a better ecosystem, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, if people expanded their time horizons uh, with regards to projects, uh, because we're living in this obviously, digital age and everything is here and now. We want to get rich quick and we want the project to be a success immediately. But true businesses that are successful are built with solid and sound foundations. And that comes with hard work and time, unfortunately. And I think we just need to remember those key principles 
um, you know, yes, you can become that unicorn uh, without a shadow of a doubt, but it might take time and, uh, and we may be needing to, to go back and take a step back to, to realize that. Yeah, exactly. And this is also a very good point. You know, these kind of things don't happen overnight. And when yeah. I see a project growing in market cap uh, overnight by thousands of percents, you know, that's yeah. a red flag. Something, yeah, something is going on. That's not long term sustainable. Anyway, mm. um, uh, Matt, um, what kind of trends are you seeing, uh, you know, as, as a layer one in, in, in both DeFi and, and with institutional involvement? Yeah, it's super interesting, actually. Um, I think we're seeing kind of a migration from a permission chain in its totality environment to a permissionless chain, but with uh, kind of the addition of walled gardens. Um, for example, I talked to a lot of projects around like Hyperledger, Cora. I just saw an article about the Australian Securities Exchange like abandoning their $250 million permission blockchain project. I think that was like yesterday. And so um, I think uh, we're really seeing a migration from these like permission, solely permission environments to a permissionless environment in which you can have kind of a, a part of it in, in kind of a walled garden. And I think subnets provide like the perfect architecture for that. Um, for example, um, there's a asset backed securities or a structured finance protocol that built, uh, kind of works with a lot of very large scale institutions, like meaning banks, and uh, they're building their own subnet in which it'll only be permissioned to those banks. And um, so it really provides the architecture for institutions to feel um, comfortable and regulatory compliant going on chain. And it's kind of a, a semi permissioned manner that's connected uh, to the permissionless environment. And so um, it's very interesting what we're seeing. I think we're going to continue to see a trickle of projects come over from like solely permission chains that want to take part in permissionless DeFi or even launch their own kind of, like I said, walled garden, a subnet. And so it's regulatory compliant, but also want to be able to uh, kind of be connected to the primary network or a larger permissionless network for monetary reasons and ease of use reasons. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing. Cool. And, and, and any exciting updates uh, that we can look forward to in the Avalanche ecosystem? Yeah. So we actually just released um, our, our BAMF update and that allowed for proof of authority subnets to transition to proof of stake subnets, meaning now they can be um, permissionless in terms of who validates them and it can become more decentralized over time. So most subnets launch with like five to ten validators, meaning they're very centralized, but this update will allow them to grow from like 10 to 20 validators to hopefully a few hundred. And so it's uh, much more decentralized over time. And then in terms of future updates that I'm very excited for, uh, we have an update that... <laughs> It's called Teleporter internally, and I don't know if that'll be the kind of finalized name for it, but essentially it's our interoperable, uh, sorry, interoperability solution in terms of uh, messaging between subnets and uh, like a transport layer between subnets and, and whatnot. And hopefully that'll be live sometime in 2023. And the architecture that has been teased so far is essentially using our P chain or our platform chain because all subnet validators have to also validate the primary network. And um, using that and using BLS signatures to really provide uh, one of the best kind of interoperability solutions out there that should hopefully rival something like Cosmos's IBC, so inner blockchain communication. So that's something that I'm personally super excited about in the future. Yeah, I can totally imagine, man. It does sound super exciting. I, I, I can, I can obviously recommend everyone to keep an eye on what's, what's, what's going to happen in the next few yeah. months and, and, and in the coming years with regards to what you guys are doing, man. It's, uh, it's super exciting, and uh, definitely we'll continue looking for, for, for ways to further strengthen our coll collaboration on that. Um, uh, Darnell, anything you want to share with regards to GBG um, uh, before we dive into some of the community questions that uh, that I saw going around? Um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go for the questions for now. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, the first one that uh, I saw from MASH, um, future advantages. Uh, what are the future advantages for a seeker and funders consider TIDV for the pre-sales? Um, so we know um, when we did our TGE that um, it's, it's really not that straightforward to uh, uh, raise funds compliantly. Um, uh, we took a lot of effort, a lot of legal fees, and uh, 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 I can honestly say I haven't slept a lot of hours uh, around that time. And, uh, and, and for good reason, right? This needs to be done very well. And it's, 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 it's mainly very time-consuming, costly, and requires a lot of, a lot of focus. And we know that every project that, you know, is in here for the long term will be forced to deal with all the same things. So we want, you know, to offer tools for each seeker and the seeker, uh, to be clear for, 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 for the people that don't understand what a seeker is. A seeker is a project that's listed on funders looking for funds, seeking for funds. Uh, so in, in, in essence, you know, the more we can do to lower the barriers to raise funds compliantly, um, uh, the better it is for a project so they can focus, you know, on execution of the roadmap, the product development, uh, uh, community management, um, and, 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 and still, you know, follow all the best practices that uh, uh, we ensure of that we keep uh, putting into the product as it evolves. Um, yeah, and then uh, from, from Zaxter, there is a question uh, with regards to, uh, yeah, so as, as pre previously mentioned, uh, situations like FTX, Celsius, uh, they're not a problem of bad technology, but instead bad actors. And I really agree with this. Um, and, and, and he feels that these bad actors are impeding the rate of adoption of DeFi and blockchain technology. So how can we offer investors the assurance that such incidents will not happen when working within our ecosystem? Is TIDV the main solution we have to offer uh, more compliance within the space? Um, so as I, as I mentioned already, already a couple of times, I do think that as a community, we can also um, uh, uh, add value, you know, ourselves together by being more uh, strict on, you know, which projects we want to interact with and whatnot. Um, and, and, and definitely TIDV, we do, we do see play a role, um, a, a very important, uh, significant role. Um, but next to that, you know, our, our compliance protocol through, through Nexera um, is, is, is going to offer a scalable growing um, uh, solution for, for projects that, that need compliance at its heart for, for tokenized securities, for example, where um, regulations can be extremely complicated because of different jurisdictions, uh, different kind of assets, <clears throat> and different kind of flows, especially when it goes across jurisdictions. So an extendable, scalable uh, uh, solution really makes sense. So this is um, it's not just the IDV, it's Nexera, and it's a combination of really, it's, it's us. We have the power, guys. Um, and, and, and then last question uh, that I saw in, um, in, in the main chat of Alliance Block, it's um, uh, around funders, uh, a need for emphasis on, on the features of funders. So I can shortly address this. I know that we are really running out of time, so I'll try to keep it short. But you know, the funders that we have today is, um, uh, is still going to go through a lot of evolutions. And the funders that we you know, ultimately envision it's uh, a platform where the community can come together, where they have the power, where they can become DAO members, DAO delegators, where they can decide whether a project will be able to get funding or not. And when they get funding, we, we, we call it milestone-based based financing. They only get a part of the funding for the first next milestone. And then when they hit that milestone, it's on the project to provide the proof that they've actually hit the milestone. And then the community can vote whether or not this milestone indeed, in their opinion, has not been hit or has been hit. And only if it has been hit, then they will get the next uh, milestone. And by collaborating together as a community, you earn reputation. If somebody asks a question and you answer it well, you earn reputation. And the more reputation you have, the more you can do on on funders and actually the more you can do, you know, also in, in, in other parts of this ecosystem. So, you know, reputation or through RLBT um, uh, is, 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 is a really important factor. And it's basically an, a non-monetary reward for your behavior in the ecosystem, which I think is, is only fair. And earning, being able to earn uh, ultimately RLBT this way, it 
it, it creates an, 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 a situation of equal opportunity. So yeah, funders, it's, it's really, it's a community driven platform um, uh, uh, where um, fair and transparent fundraising um, are going to be enabled. And the best thing is everything is on chain. So everything is transparent, everything can be followed, as opposed to, you know, some launch pads that, you know, rely on backend centralized databases, and uh, you don't truly know uh, what's going to happen. So um, I, I think, you know, those are the questions that we can address today. Um, so uh, any, any final points that maybe you want to throw in, uh, Matt or Darnell? You want to go anyone first, Arnaud, wants... or you want... <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, anyone that wants to uh, to talk more uh, about, you know, KYC, Bitcoin, what we've spoken about on here, yeah, feel free to, to hit me up. I'm on both LinkedIn and obviously on Twitter as well. So, yeah, go for it. Yeah, same, same as Darnell said for me. I also just want to add, um, stay positive during these times. Uh, make sure to check on your friends, check on... I mean... My family isn't too much in crypto, but make sure you check on your friends in crypto. And uh, hopefully after everything gets sorted out, we can come out of this stronger. And it, I, I think it will get better, hopefully, sometime in the next year. But don't, don't quote me on that. So, <laughs> not, not financial advice, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely not price. Out, yeah, but you know what I'm saying. Better as an industry. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you for those words. It's, it's very... Very important thing that you said. Uh, now, especially now, with what happened, we know that a lot of people got got hurt. You know, financially, um, it's it's probably not the best of times for a lot of people. Absolutely, you know, support each other, check into each other, and uh, uh, help each other. You know, now we can show how strong we are as a community, how we can come together and be no mercy. Together, we can uh, we can bring change for the better. And we've saw we've seen historically with you know crisis events like this that you know it, it ultimately comes with you know innovation that would help us you know go forward as an industry in better ways you know bitcoin was uh, was born out of out of a crisis economic crisis and we can do this again guys it's on us now so um yeah uh, man matt darnell Huge thanks for joining this space. Absolutely loved speaking to you. And uh, as said before, a recording of this space will be made available so everybody can listen back. Um, I think uh, I, I, I super enjoyed it. I hope uh, everybody that listened in enjoyed it too. Um, and looking forward to, uh, to speaking again next, next time. Thanks yeah. very much for the invite. Appreciate it. All right. That yeah, thank you as well. Thank you, guys. We will conclude this space then, and I hope everybody will allow, have a lovely rest of the day. And no mercy, guys. Uh, keep huddling. <laughs>